You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs. Today, my guest is Dr. Marcus R. Ross. He's a paleontologist and CEO of Cornerstone Educational Supply. He's a longtime science educator. He's taught for 16 years plus as professor of geology and the director of the Center of Creation Studies at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. So welcome, Marcus. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Richard. It's a real treat and a delight to be here. Well, excellent. Tell me a bit about your background. What got you into paleontology and awakened that interest? It was awakened really early. I was one of those kids who learned about dinosaurs when I was four, and I caught that bug and just never let it go. I remember sitting in my cousin's room, and he was, you and I both remember records, and we remember learning how to read on records. It was one of those little read-along record books, and there was no book, but it was about dinosaurs, and there was all this roaring and crashing and screeching and music and, you know, bump, bump, bump. And I was just transfixed. I couldn't believe what I was listening to. And so, you know, then off to the library I went and, you know, asked my parents, could you get me that plastic bag o dinosaurs that we all had growing up with the fluorescent pink, you know, trachodon and stuff like that. And I just, I, when I was seven, I learned that there was such a thing as a paleontologist, a, a person whose job it is to go out and uh, excavate fossils and to learn about earth history. And from that point on, I just, you know, kind of thought this is exactly what I want to do. And I was a stubborn enough little kid that growing all the way through high school, even though, yeah, I wanted to be in the military and fly jets. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to, you know, play baseball. All of that always just took a second seat to getting a chance to study God's creation, to study dinosaurs and fossils and all that sort of stuff. And so that's what got the whole ball rolling. Did you have faith in Christianity your whole life or did you come to faith at a later age and how did that influence uh, desire to be a paleontologist and how you do paleontology? That's a good question. They coincided in time pretty early on. I, I learned about paleontology when I was four, and I became a professing believer in Jesus as Savior when I was probably around five or six. And so these two passions really were on you know parallel tracks all the, the time that I was growing up. My family is uh, spiritually mixed. My mom, my sister, and I are all Christians, and my dad's an agnostic. And so I still was always surrounded by folks who viewed things differently than I did. My extended family was largely Catholic and didn't kind of view the Bible the same way that I did. So I was surrounded by folks who didn't always see the world the way that I did, but I was also raised in an environment that fostered, uh, I think, a very strong science-faith interaction and a way to, to look at the world that is unified, both from the pages of Scripture and from you know the book of nature, as some call it. And as you were doing your studies, and then when you went on to advanced work, did you have secular pushback, I guess I'd call it, like a uh you know, oh, that, that's ridiculous type stuff. Or, uh, you know, if you're going to be in this, this industry, um, you know, you better get rid of that stuff. Otherwise, you won't succeed. Like, did you have any, any trouble? I did from time to time. I went to three different schools for my studies. I first went to undergraduate at Penn State University. Then I went out to the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City, South Dakota for a master's degree in paleontology. And then I boomeranged back to my home state of Rhode Island to pursue a PhD in geology or paleontology. And so at each of those areas, I encountered different types of pushback. First off, as an undergraduate at Penn State, you know, the, the cool thing is when you're an undergraduate, nobody cares about you or what you do or what you think, you know, to a certain extent. It's not like the faculty are, are threatened by someone who is a creationist. And I was known to be a creationist to my advisors, to other people in the geology department at Penn State. And, and I have nothing but good things and good memories from Penn State. I, I was treated really well. Faculty didn't agree with me on this issue. And, you know, sometimes they pushed me a little bit, but I was always treated fairly. That was, you know, just a wonderful experience. And uh, my major advisor, uh, the late uh, Dr. Roger Cuffey, always treated me with great respect and care uh, as a mentor, and uh, I, I miss him. Uh, in South Dakota, I learned that uh, people take you a lot more seriously when uh, you're trying to go for uh, an advanced degree compared to just an undergraduate, and I found out that uh, opinions and ideas that you express outside the class can come back in the class and hurt you. I was nearly uh, driven out of the program at South Dakota for opinions I had outside, and uh, I got an email from my major advisor at the time saying, and I quote, I will not allow you to destroy what I have spent 30 years of my life building. 
And uh, that's a rough wow. email to get. Yeah. My first year, he basically tried to fail me out of a class and flunk me out of the program. But uh, God wouldn't allow him to do that. Uh, in the end, my grades took a, a, a turn for the worse, but they pulled back up. And uh, I had to wander around for a good two and a half years without a thesis project, without an advisory committee, with a whole bunch of people just wishing I would weave. Heck, I wished I could weave, but I couldn't because you know my grades looked pretty bad for a little bit. But uh, God eventually brought along a, a scientist by the name of Gail Bishop to be the museum director, and he pulled me into his office one day and he said, Marcus, I've been hired here to help students, not to be to make friends. And you've done everything that you need to do get, to get out, so let's get you a project and move you out. And, you know, that was a godsend, I think literally a, a godsend. Uh, and then I learned in, South, in Rhode Island, my PhD work, so there, there are just wonderfully great folks out there who disagree with you uh, sometimes passionately, but uh, all my fellow graduate students and my advisor there, Dr. David Fostovsky, treated me with tremendous respect. And, and so one of the weird lessons that I kind of learned from all of this is that actually when I, at my most vulnerable, when I was in a deep red state, so to speak, you know, to use the political terminology here. And I think that's because when you've got uh, folks who disagree strongly with the surrounding area, whichever direction that happens to be, they kind of feel like they're under assault. And so in South Dakota, to have a young earth creationist in the paleontology program, even when they accepted me knowing that, you know, the fact that I was willing to think that way and express those ideas even outside the class was too much. It was it was like the Visigoths got in the gate and they, they had to be eliminated. Whereas in places like Penn State and Rhode Island, you know, kind of a purplish state and a deep blue state, I was, you know, not treated badly at all. In fact, I think in Rhode Island, I was kind of an intellectual curiosity for some of the faculty. Interesting. But some of the work that you've done, just, you know, whatever comes to mind, what, what's some of the most fascinating things to you that you've discovered or looked at or you know, analyzed, even if there's no firm conclusion yet? Thanks. It's a neat question. Uh, for I'll give two examples. Uh, because I went through my education within the secular community, I always did my work for them as if I was a standard evolutionary paleontologist. I wasn't going to be writing stuff about creationism in classes or for theses or things like that. So I got to work on some fascinating animals called mosasaurs for my master's and PhD work. And, and mosasaurs are giant marine lizards that are swimming in the oceans uh, alongside the dinosaurs who are on land. And uh, if any of your Listeners remember the first Jurassic World movie, the big swimming marine thing that comes up and eats people out of the ocean. Those were the things that I got to study. Now, they weren't quite as big in real life as they were in the movie, because all you have to do is say genetically modified organism and Hollywood allows, you know, physics need not apply. But nonetheless, these animals went anywhere from about 10 to 55 feet in length and were absolutely monstrous and terrifying. And I got to look at their diversity and ultimately their extinction patterns throughout the course of their existence in the rock record. And so that was a really fun project. I really enjoyed working on that. On the creation side of things, I've been involved in a, a few different areas looking at how would we identify, for example, Noah's flood from the sedimentary rocks that have all these fossils in them. Are there clues from the fossils themselves about where the flood starts and where the flood stops and what rocks belong in the flood and what are either before or perhaps even after Noah's flood? And so kind of looking statistically at, at how fossils are distributed has been a point that I've been interested in. Does that yeah. show you where the flood would have started or where it would have been uh, reached the highest, like, you know, based on the structure of land masses, you know, like there's valleys and et cetera. Are there places where that would have flooded first and where did, it, did the flood begin according to the distribution of these fossils? That's a really interesting question. So according to the models that we have right now for how Noah's flood operated, you and your readers have no doubt heard of things like plate tectonics and Pangea. Young Earth creationists largely believe that the movements of the plates are happening during Noah's flood. And it's actually the movements of these plates that are the cause of the flood itself. They're the sources of energy that are driving ocean water up over top of the continents and flooding the world as described in Genesis 7 and 8 in particular. And uh, looking at the fossils, the beginning of the flood, there's a pretty broad consensus that the beginning of the flood is uh, what we call the great unconformity. So for your listeners, uh, an unconformity in geology is a surface between two rocks that represents a, a break in time. And it's usually an erosion level. And you know, whatever you had there has been eroded away. So you kind of lose the time that was there from those rocks. So there's this feature in North America that goes from one end of the continent to the other. And it's kind of like this continent-wide scour mark. And I've got it here in Virginia where I live. I've seen it in Pennsylvania. I've seen it in South Dakota, down in, Alaska, uh, down in uh, Arizona. It's all over the place. And we think that 
this represents the beginning phase of the flood as the flood waters start scouring off the continents. And then above that, we start seeing all sorts of different fossils getting deposited, uh, mostly marine animals that are being driven on top of the continents. At the end of the flood, what we're looking for is um, some sort of break in the fossil record between the sort of critters that are below that were buried and deposited in sand and mud and now becoming stone and the animals that eventually make their way back to continents like North America or South America or Australia. And there should be some sort of significant break. There should be a difference between what we see below and what we see before, because what gets buried in a particular place in the flood might have no relation to what eventually comes back to live in that area, especially have moved. So I would say that the most likely candidate for that end of the flood line is somewhere around the last dinosaur remains, what we tend to call the K- PG boundary, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And you know, some other creationists have different opinions, but I, I tend to think that that represents a really good spot where the fossils shift fairly substantially between what's below and what's above. So what does that tell you? Like, um, So before the flood, do you think that that's when Pangea, Pangea existed and the flood, everything broke apart and migrated the continents? Yeah, actually, we think that Pangaea was formed during the early phases of Noah's flood, that the continents were actually in a different different configuration, and they actually collide together to form Pangaea, uh, because that's when many of our mountain belts, like the Appalachians, where I happen to live, are initially formed. We have sedimentary rocks like sandstones and limestones and shales. They have to form flat because you know sand and mud fall down through water, and they create kind of a flat sheet. Well, in the Appalachians, we see those kinds of rocks, but they're in these big wrinkles and folds. So that tells us is the folds have to happen after the original sediment was laid down. So since the Appalachians are formed when Pangaea is colliding, that means that the continents had to be in some pre-position before the collision. So from a creation flood perspective, we think that Pangaea is formed early on in the flood, maybe in the first couple of months, and then it actually splits apart and then the continents begin to migrate towards their locations today. And by the time the flood ends, they're not quite there yet, but much of the land is now high and dry. Noah can get off of the ark. The animals can begin to disperse. And we start seeing very different animals around in North America, for example, in the early Cenozoic, this Paleogene, than what we saw in the Cretaceous, which has, you know, things like your T-Rex, Triceratops, your, your duck-billed dinosaurs, and other sorts of things further below in the, in the sequence. Well, wouldn't this mean that west of the Appalachians versus east of the Appalachians, you would see very different ground because if those two pieces came together and upthrust the Appalachians, you know, those, I guess, were two separate continental pieces that, again, collided to do that. So I would think they would look very different. Is that the case, or am I wrong? The Appalachians and the Western U.S. do look very different in a number of areas. The Appalachians look most similar, actually, to the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, for example, uh, the Scottish Highlands, and the Scandinavian Mountains. Those, when you put Pangaea all back together again, form a nice linear trend, if you will, and uh, all their geology matches up pretty nice. The types of fossils found them are pretty much the same. On the west side of the United States, the Rockies pop up much, much later in time. For a creationist, that would be several months later. Uh, on the conventional time, it's many millions of years later. But the types of rocks that we see and the types of fossils are sometimes the same, but there's a lot more stuff on top that is different. So out here in Virginia, we don't have much for dinosaur fossils. We only have some footprints here and there. Everything else has been kind of scraped away out into the Atlantic or, or isn't preserved. And out west, we have, you know, the great dinosaur bearing units of Utah and Colorado, the Dakotas, Montana. Has anyone been able to reconstruct what the continents look like and where they were before Pangea? There are a number of different reconstructions for that. Yeah, there's kind of an idea of a previous supercontinent before that, but it's actually kind of, it gets trickier the further back away from Pangaea you get. We use a lot of what's called magnetostratigraphy. We actually look at magnetic mineral grains in rocks. They act like little puss needles. They point towards north, and uh, they also angle into the earth a little bit depending on where they are compared to that north, but they don't give us good longitude. So they give us good latitude. Where are you in one direction, but they don't help us with the lateral configuration with the continents as much. So th that's a little bit less certain, but we certainly do know that the continents were in a, a previous position. They hit as part of Pangaea and that, then after that split apart to where we are today. Oh, but the maps of what it looked like. They might vary from worker to worker. So yeah. And you 
other images out there that people could see to get an idea of what it probably looked like? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head to just uh, have it to slip my mind the name of uh, some of the particular pre-Pangean continental arrangements. But if they look up maps for something called Laurentia, L-A-U-R-N-T-I-A, Laurentia is the name of North America before it's technically North America. So you can look up maps of where that would be going back further and further in time. And that'll show you where the other continents are as well, you know, Proto-Asia and South America, et cetera. Okay. Where does it appear that the flood started? Or did it start in multiple places around the globe and you know, everything kind of converged quickly after that? It would seem that the the beginning of the flood happens in what we call the late Precambrian. So if we're thinking about going to a natural history museum and we're looking for fossils, most of those fossils start in what's called the Cambrian and go up through uh, today. And that's what we often call the fossil record. It's part of a big group of rocks that we call collectively the Phanerozoic, which means visible life. Because you can see these fossils without aid of a microscope. Below the Cambrian, you have uh, a couple layers with some interesting visible fossils, and those are probably part of the flood as well. And then once you get below those, almost all the fossils that we have are microbial like They're bacteria, single-celled organisms, some algae, things that I think are reflecting the types of organisms that were created during creation week and preparing the, the oceans and the world for habitation. So stuff that would have been created on days one, two, and three, for example, day three, Three in the creation account, we get the creation of land plants. So we're going to have a mature, functional world of creation with all sorts of different organisms at the time of the flood. And it seems that just a little bit below the Cambrian, when you go into your natural history museums, pretty much all the fossils that you're going to see there are the result of the flood or some of the events after the flood. In the fossil record, does it appear that before the flood, that's when dinosaurs would have been around and it seemed like, you know, a significant percentage of animals were huge before the flood and after, maybe I'm wrong, they seemed to be a lot smaller. I mean, even like a secular view of it, like, you know, the sim- like a, a funny video yeah. a few years ago, you know, where they, they showed Homer Simpson like swimming in the ocean, you know, they, they went through like the whole, you know, range of evolution, this uh, Simpsons video. But, you know, I, I'm from reading books and learning supposedly that uh, after the flood, again, animals were much smaller. Do you see that's the case or is there really no size change in general? Well, uh, I think that immediately after the flood, we did have a lot smaller organisms, I think in part because as Noah was commanded to bring two of every kind onto the ark, you're not going to bring uh, grandma and grandpa, right? Because the, the whole point of this is that the animals are going to be able to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth afterwards. So first off, you don't want to bring large, mature organisms. You're going to want to bring young ones that are going to spend their you know initial teen years on the ark and then ready to go when they leave. Uh, also, you probably don't need to bring the biggest members of each particular kind with you. So you don't need to bring some gigantic sauropod on board the ark if if dinosaurs are going on the ark. You're going to bring a smaller representative of that particular group. Now, were animals on the whole larger before the flood? That's a good question. I'd say, you know, on some areas, yes, certainly dinosaurs are much larger than mammals. For example, on the whole, the average dinosaur is probably about the size of a bison if you were to kind of average everybody, whereas the average mammal is much closer to the size of uh, a dog or smaller, maybe even a cat. At. But on the other hand, things in the ocean, just about the same sizes. Uh, you know, we have these really big trilobites that are the size of dinner plates, and we think, oh my goodness, these things were huge. But then you take an Alaskan king crab and you go, oh my goodness, that thing's huge, and put it on my dinner plate, right? So I think in, in the ocean, we're a little bit more even in things. We did have, you know, some fantastically huge insects prior to the flood, which are, are terrifying. Uh, an animal called Meganeura, which is kind of like a dragonfly that had a wingspan of like two feet across. It's it's gargantuan. And a, and a fossil centipede that was six feet in length. Just hideous and terrifying. Uh, but we also have things that are tremendously tiny. So there was, I guess one of the things that is cool take home for this is that the world before the flood was immensely rich far richer than even our world is today, making it actually seem like we live in a depauperate place by comparison. Depauperate? Yes, a much poorer and species poor kind of environment by comparison. Yeah, no, it's an interesting word. I, you know, it, I feel like I just studied the city as you said, it's just interesting. I never heard that word. But yeah, very cool. So in what ways was it richer in terms of, you know, more diversity of uh, animal life or, you know, what was richer about it? I think Yes, there was a lot more diversity, both in terms of the number of species and the types of organisms that happened to be around. Uh, I think after Noah's flood, 
The Bible does say that two of every kind were brought on board the ark, but it doesn't say that they all survive to today, right? We know that we drive species to extinctions and groups to extinction. I think that the post-flood world is kind of a sweepstakes, and some organisms never had the foundation of their ecosystem revive after the flood, right? The types of plants that uh, pop up after the flood, I think, are dominated by the types of plants we see around us today, the flowering plants that produce fruit and conifers, things like that. Whereas we take a look in the fossil record, we see lots of other types of plants that don't either exist today or exist in very marginal areas. And I, I think that when the world kind of reemerges after the flood, there's a lot of ecosystems that never get their feet underneath them. And as a result, there's a cascading effect on the types of animals and plants that would have been there. And we don't get to see them anymore, but they were there at the beginning. Interesting. Any other, you know, when you say richness, uh, what else was rich about it? Or really not much else to describe richness besides that? You know, it, it could be that the density of organisms was just higher, that, uh, you know, places were more lush and perhaps the, the world itself was a little bit more temperate or the continents may have been distributed in such a way that allowed for, you know, fewer desert zones and, you know, wouldn't have a place like Antarctica maybe sitting on, on the South Pole, making it uninhabitable. So if we've got our continents arranged in a different configuration than today, we can even house a significantly larger amount of life forms on land. And that would have a, a pretty significant effect on, on things. Okay. I guess, you know, fast forwarding a little bit through the flood, what does fossil creation look like today? Like, you know, if people dig, uh, are they able to find a continuous fossil record up until very recently? Or, you know, because the flood was created most of the fossil record, do we not see, do we see very few or almost no fossils since? It depends on where you are, how much you're going to see. So where I live in central Virginia, we basically have no fossils whatsoever. I'm sitting on a group of metamorphic rocks from uh, what I think are probably creation week rocks, and they have no fossils in them whatsoever. If I want to find some fossils, I have to drive about 40 minutes uh, to an hour in almost any direction, as it turns out. I'm in kind of a dead bullseye here. But depends on where you are. Where I lived in South Dakota when I was working on my master's degree, if you started at, say, Mount Rushmore, looking at the granite chiseled visages of the presidents up there, you're looking at what I think are creation week rocks. But if you start walking out from the Black Hills towards, say, the Badlands National Park, you're going to walk through almost all the different layers of geology, and you're going to find trilobites, you're going to find clams, you're going to find brachiopods, you're going to find these cool squid-like nautiloids, you're going to find dinosaurs, you're going to find fossil mammals, and that record is pretty continuous because that area happened to be a pretty low spot through most of the flood and into the pre-flood world. It happened to be in a, a big region out in front of the Rockies that was kind of constantly low. And so sediments could flow down into that area. On the other hand, here by the Appalachians, when the Appalachians pop up, you're not going to preserve fossils because this area is eroding away. So the Appalachians started forming early on in the flood, and they started eroding pretty early on. The Rockies, on the other hand, stayed low for a long time and only popped up much later on. So you get a deeper record of more stuff out over there than you have, say, where I live. What about, again, when the fossil record, when the fossils were being formed incredibly actively, you know, during the flood? Was there an apparent order to fossilization? You know, like, I don't know how far below or above, you know, fossil A versus fossil B was, you know, when you look in these, um, in these areas where there are fossils, like, can you tell what was laid down first and next and next and next? And what's, you know, why did it happen in that order? Yeah, you, you can tell what happened first, second, and third. There are a couple of really helpful principles that were established way early on in the history of geology, going back to the 1600s and the early 1700s. And we can more or less read the sedimentary rocks and those fossils kind of like a book. And we read them, or more like a messy desk, if you will. I, I don't always have such a clean desk. And so if I want to find something that I haven't seen in a while, I know I have to go down, right? Because old things are on the bottom and younger things get piled up on top of it. And that's the same situation with geology. When sediments are forming and fossils are getting, you know, or animals are getting buried in with them to make fossils, the first ones that are going to be made are going to be low down and then more stuff is going to get piled sequentially above it. And that's perhaps, you know, one of the most surprising things about the fossil record is that the sequence of different types of fossils can be traced from one place to another. It's a sequence that Darwin said could be explained by evolution. Darwin didn't invent the geological column or this idea of layers and, and fossils in order. That was pretty much already accomplished and completed. That work was known when he was writing The Origin. But what he said was that evolution explains why there are these different patterns to the fossils. 
young earth creationist like myself has got to come to grips first off with the fact and the reality that there is an order that can be traced from Europe to the Americas to Asia. It is a fundamental reality. And then we have to explain why that order exists the way that it does. One of the features that I think is helpful in understanding that is that generally speaking, we are looking at an order that begins with marine organisms and then kind of eventually gets you up into far more terrestrial types of critters. And I think that can be explained on the broad scale by floodwaters that are rising, starting in the ocean and driving ocean material to the land, land animals fleeing and eventually getting buried on top of the stuff that was from the oceans. So we both recognize the overall pattern of the fossil record. What we have are alternate explanations for them. And uh, the creationist explanation for this I would say is not as robust as the old earth or the evolutionary one yet. We haven't had nearly so much time to work on it. And so, you know, if an evolutionist said, well, what about all these, you know, these counterexamples to that? I'd have to say, hey, yeah, you've got some good points here, but I think that we've got some good promise moving forward with these ideas. Okay. Yeah, that's a fair way to put it. So what would be the last creatures and where, you know, things that lived on mountains, maybe mountain goats or, or I don't know, you know, stuff that lived very high up, would they have been the last to succumb to the flood? Certainly anything that could get to high ground. And the tricky thing about the flood is that ground is going to be shifting and moving. And, you know, what's high ground at one point might not be high ground in a couple of weeks. You might have a situation where you have valleys that are forming and land that is sinking. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, land animals that are fairly sizable are going to have a better chance of outmaneuvering the flood than not. You know, we find dinosaurs higher up in the rock record than lots of other things. Most of the mammal fossil record, I think, is actually post-flood. I think a lot of the mammals, uh, we do have some mammals in, in what I think are the flood rocks, but they tend to be fairly small ones associated with the dinosaur groups found alongside them at least. But things like mountain goats, such as you mentioned, I think are actually a post-flood variation on a pre-flood group that really, for whatever reason, we don't have much for fossils of uh, until we get to the post-flood world, that is. Yeah. Okay. Well, Marcus, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been uh, a great call and I really appreciate you being here. Oh, it sure has. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Richard. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 